In this video, we're going to tackle one of the big topics, arguably the biggest topic in climate science global warming and climate change. Now, if you missed the previous videos on the first law of thermodynamics and radiation, you can check them out here and here, but I'm going to recap the relevant points later on in the video as we come to them. In more than one way, global warming is an energy problem. The first law of thermodynamics states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, only changed from one form into another, and that if the amount of energy entering an object is different from the amount of energy leaving an object, then that object's temperature will change. Now, the Earth is in thermodynamic equilibrium with the Sun, with the amount of energy that we absorb from the Sun in the form of radiation being equal to the amount of energy that we thermally radiate out into space. If for some reason the amount of energy that the Earth radiated were to increase, then the resulting energy imbalance will cause the Earth to cool, while if for some reason the Earth were to start radiating less energy into space, the resulting energy imbalance will cause the Earth to warm. This second scenario is exactly what we are seeing happening. The Earth is warming due to an energy imbalance. The question isn't if that's happening. The observational evidence to quote the scientific establishment is unequivocal. The question instead is why it's happening and how fast. Okay, so evidence indicates that the Earth is warming due to radiating less energy than it absorbs. So let's consider the possibilities of what could be responsible. One, the Sun is emitting more energy than it used to, and so the Earth is absorbing more energy than it used to. It's well known that the Sun varies in its power output, but over the past 400 years it's only varied by 0.2%, so not enough to account for the global warming that we observe. Two, the Earth is now absorbing more of the energy that the Sun is giving out. Now, the Earth's orbit isn't perfectly circular. It has eccentricity, ellipticity, and it processes around the Sun. And these minor variations in its orbit give rise to so-called Milankovitch cycles. These are cycles which uh, determine over a 26,000-year period how much energy the Earth is receiving at the surface. And comparing the amount of energy that the Earth is receiving at the surface to the global average surface temperature, we actually see an anti-correlation. The more energy that the Earth receives at the surface, then global temperatures go down. So this isn't the culprit. And even accounting for changes in the how reflective the Earth is, its albedo, doesn't account for the energy imbalance that we're seeing. Three, there is an additional source of heating which is introducing more energy into the Earth system. Now, depending on who you talk to, this could be earthquakes, volcanoes, meteors, and pretty much anything, in fact. But the fact of the matter is that there is no correlation between the frequency of these events and global average temperatures. The only possible link would be an increase in volcanic activity leading into uh, more aerosols being injected into the atmosphere, so things like dust and um, sulfuric acid being injected into the stratosphere. But if that were the case, then we'd actually see a cooling as a result of increased activity. And we haven't seen a cooling, we've seen a warming, and there hasn't been a statistically significant increase in volcanic activity over the past century anyway. 4. The Earth is now emitting less radiation into space than it used to. And comparing the total outgoing radiation at the top of the atmosphere to the global average temperature, we finally see a statistically significant correlation. This is a hugely, hugely complex system that we are talking about, and so there's not going to be one culprit. But the main culprit in global warming is this decrease in outgoing radiation. The question now then is, what's causing it? In the second video in this series, we talked about the fact that the Earth's atmosphere is very good at absorbing long wavelength or thermal radiation, and that each layer in the atmosphere absorbs and then re-emits the thermal radiation that's given off by the surface, with the signal getting weaker and weaker the higher you go. Now, the chemical that's mostly responsible for this effect is carbon dioxide, which, due to its molecular structure, is very efficient at absorbing long wavelength radiation. What this means is, if you were in space and wanted to guess the temperature of Earth based on the amount of radiation that it's giving out, with hotter objects giving out more thermal radiation, then you'd guess a temperature way lower than what we experience here at the surface. And this is because, as we talked about in the very first video in this series, at least to begin with, the atmosphere gets cooler the higher you go up, as well as getting thinner. And eventually, the atmosphere gets to a point where it's so thin that thermal radiation that's emitted just escapes off into space, because there aren't enough atmospheric atoms above that point to get in the way and absorb the radiation. Now, we call the temperature of that layer the effective temperature, and the height at which that temperature occurs the effective emission height. 
For the Earth, the effective temperature is about 252 Kelvin, or minus 21 degrees Celsius, which is the equivalent of the Earth emitting all of its thermal radiation from about halfway up the troposphere, so effective emission height of between 5 and 6 kilometers above the surface. For the Earth to emit less radiation into space, then, it would have to have a lower effective temperature. But what could cause that? Enter carbon dioxide. Because CO2 absorbs thermal wavelengths of radiation, it's what prevents thermal radiation emitted in the lower atmosphere from escaping out into space. It effectively determines how transparent the atmosphere is to thermal radiation. The more CO2 you have in the atmosphere, the less transparent it is, and so the higher you have to climb before thermal radiation can escape off into space, increasing the effective emission height. And the troposphere gets cooler the higher you go. So increasing CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere leads to a greater effective emission height and so a lower effective temperature. CO2 concentrations, therefore, effectively determine how much energy the Earth radiates out into space, and so determines its temperature. Since the Industrial Revolution, we've been increasing CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere faster than at any other time in the Earth's history. In 1750, before the Industrial Revolution, every million molecules in the Earth's atmosphere contained 280 molecules of CO2. While well, today, in 2015, every million molecules in the atmosphere contains 400 CO2 molecules. Now that might not seem like a hugely significant increase, but compare that to the past 400,000 years of CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. We are influencing the planet in ways that it has never been influenced before. CO2 concentrations have been much higher in the past, but they have never changed this quickly in the past, which means that the climate has never changed this quickly and life on Earth is utterly unprepared for that. Now, carbon dioxide is the poster child of global warming. It's the molecule that everyone has heard of. But sometimes you hear of other molecules, like methane, uh, nitrous oxides, water vapour, being referred to as greenhouse gases. And what this means simply is that these molecules also absorb long wavelengths, thermal wavelengths of radiation, and in some cases do so much more effectively than CO2. The difference is, though, that with the exception of water vapour, these molecules have a much lower concentration in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide, and so have less of a net greenhouse effect than CO2. Water vapour is actually the most significant greenhouse gas of all, contributing about 50% of the net greenhouse effect. However, because it hasn't seen an exponential increase in concentration since the Industrial Revolution, it tends to get ignored when people talk about global warming. But it's worth noting that as the planet warms, the atmosphere will actually be able to support more and more water vapour, so we can expect it to play an even greater role in the greenhouse effect in years to come. CO2 and, to a lesser extent, methane, however, get star billing when it comes to global warming because humans have, through activities like energy generation, agriculture and transport, vastly increased their concentrations in the atmosphere, and so have directly controlled and influenced global average temperatures. But by how much? It's been estimated that humans have warmed the global climate by approximately 0.8 degrees Celsius since the year 1880, which is a reasonable benchmark for how much we've warmed the climate since the Industrial Revolution. Now that's the warming to date. Warming in the future is much more uncertain, because we are forcing a vastly complex system in ways that we only have a reasonable grasp of. But the rub of it is that future changes and future warming will not be good. Much of the effect that we will have on the climate in the future will come down to how much carbon we put into the Earth's atmosphere. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, have considered multiple scenarios of emissions and, in some cases, mitigation by the world, and tried to determine what the effect will be. Now, even after a global scientific effort, we cannot say for certain how much warming will occur for a given amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, but we can say within some error bars. The 21st century will see between 0.3 and 1.7 degrees Celsius of additional warming in the best case scenario, where the world reduces emissions as the century goes on and extensively mitigates its carbon impact. In the worst case scenario, where we continue to emit as we currently are and increase emissions every year, we expect the global average change in temperature to be between 2.6 and 4.8 degrees Celsius. Now that's a global average. Some areas will see significantly more warming even than that. 
The effects of this warming are called climate change and encapsulate melting ice caps, rising sea levels, increases in extreme weather events and massive population movements. I asked my supervisor here at the University of Exeter what he expected the long-term effects of climate change to be. Unless a miracle occurs, a thousand years from now, all the ecosystems we know today will be destroyed. There may be some residual animals living in zoos kept alive, um, um, but like across Africa, all the savanna where the elephants are, gone. Um, eventually the ice caps melt. Like Florida, there's a couple little islands left. Um, it, all the plants and animals are used to very slow change in the environment, and it will be a very rapid change. But it'll be rapid, it won't be so rapid that within a given lifetime that it looks like a huge difference. Like from the time you're born to the time you die, oh, maybe snowstorms are less frequent than when you were a kid. Um, it won't be that noticeable, but you add it up over 500 years or a thousand years, and it's catastrophic. Well, this is the big question. If we carry on as we currently are and do nothing about climate change, then the end of civilization and biodiversity on this planet as we know it could be on us in centuries, maybe sooner. But we are poised the unique moment in history. We have the opportunity to decide whether we are going to take action, decisive action, to mitigate the worst effects of climate change for our descendants, or do nothing and watch this opportunity sail by. The fundamental thing that we need to do is reduce the amount of carbon that is in the atmosphere. And the first thing to do towards that goal is to reduce our emissions to zero and then beyond and start extracting carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. What that means to begin with is moving from fossil fuels such as oil, coal and natural gas to more renewable sources such as renewables like wind and hydro and also nuclear and then eventually on to other energy sources in the future like fusion. It means changing agricultural practices from carbon intensive methods like meat production to a more vegetarian diet. It means increasing efficiency in technologies from transport to home insulation. But most of the fate of the world's action on climate change rests on the Conference of Parties 21 that is happening in Paris this December. If anything is going to make the slightest dent in global warming, it's going to take coordinated international action. And the time for that action? Well, actually the best time for that action was 10 years ago. But the next best time is now. We covered a lot in this video, so if you made it this far, well done. In this video we covered the Earth's energy balance, finding that the Earth is warming because of an energy imbalance. We examined the possibilities of that energy imbalance and concluded that the Earth is radiating less energy out into space than it used to. We explained why carbon dioxide is responsible for that decrease in outgoing radiation, being that it reduces the effective temperature of the Earth. We considered other greenhouse gases like methane and water vapour. We looked at the warming to date due to carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases and also considered future warming being dependent on how much carbon we put into the atmosphere. And lastly, we considered what we can do to try and stop global warming. Next time we're going to look at what many people think of as a last resort plan of action. Geoengineering deliberately changing the Earth's climate. Now, if you'd like to swat up on the different ways in which we can change the Earth's climate, then you should check out my friend Feder's video series on the subject, where he considers all the options that are available to us. And in my video, which is going to be the last one in this crash course, we're going to look at the physics of how we could do that. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to support this series, then you can do so via its Conos page. Conos is a free website that gives you extra functionality when you're trying to learn from an online course and also gives you the opportunity to donate to support the creators. Well, me. And if you did like this video, then please do like it on YouTube and consider subscribing to this channel for more educational content. Okay, so here's my workbook. It's important because it's a book and I like books and it's got my work in. That's my laptop, which has got the scripts for the Crash Course videos in. That's my Japanese peace lily. Always important to keep that around because it keeps the air oxygenated. 